you know, the book of Shmos is referred to as Sefer Hagula, the book of redemption. In English, it's referred to as Exodus. Shmos is Exodus. Why is it Exodus? We spent 210 years in Egypt. Various levels of enslavement. And ultimately, exactly 210 years to the day, we left Egypt. And we went from bondage to freedom. And what followed was we were pursued. We were caught between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army. The sea split on, be, on our behalf. There were endless miracles that were needed and which took place, which brought about the splitting of the sea. And while the sea was split, when we went through the sea, when the Egyptian armies went through the sea, when the sea closed on the Egyptians, and how ultimately the sea had spit out the remains that the Jews should see their enemies, their masters, were no longer alive. And that's when they sang the song of the sea, which was led by Moshe. Ozioshe Moshe of Nisos Ashir Azos. Moshe had sung the song, and the Jews in unison followed Moshe. Every word he said, every sentence, they repeated. And as Moshe led the men in song to sing the praises of God, Miriam, the sister of Moshe, who was a prophetess, led the women in song to sing the praises of God. We find Moshe Rabbeinu was told by God he should go to Egypt, perform certain miracles, revealed miracles, which will prove to them that he is the redeemer. And how we must go to Pharaoh, present his credentials, and everything that follows. Initially, when he had come and he performed his, the miracles, which was a sign, a confirmation, that he was the redeemer, God's agent to take them out of Egypt, there was a work stoppage. The Jews were slaves, and the Egyptians initially they held the Jews to quotas of bricks that they had to produce every day. And they were very large numbers. The quotas were almost impossible to meet. And the Egyptians, which provide the straw and all the material that was needed, needed to make those bricks. Moshe comes and they believe that he's the redeemer. There's a work stoppage. Pharaoh is no fool. He knows exactly how to assert his authority, his iron grip on them, and he says, not a problem. They complain that they want freedom. Evidently, it's clear they have too much time on their too much time on their hands, and they have time to think. I'm going to occupy them to such a degree that they're not going to have time to think, think and they're not going to complain that they want to be freed. What are we going to do? We're going to de demand the same quota of bricks, and we're no longer going to supply the straw that's needed to make the bricks. And they're going to have to gather their own straw, and we're going to demand the same quotas. And if they don't meet those quotas, we're going to beat them. Even if we have to beat them to death. And the word went out. The Egyptian government, due to Pharaoh's decree, Straw will no longer be provided by the Egyptian government. The people who make the bricks, all the men, they have to produce the same quotas and gather their own straw. And therefore, they had no moment for themselves. There was no respite for a moment because they knew they had to meet the quotas. Otherwise, it would be very serious consequences. Okay? Moshe Rabbeinu is told by God, and the Jews are suffering tremendously. And he, say, he said, I hear the outcries of the Jews. L'chein emor levnei Yisrael ani Hashem. Therefore say to the Jewish people, I am God. 
Votsesi eschem, mitachas sevlos mitzrayim. Tell them I will take them out from under the sufferings of the Egyptians. Vitzalti eschem yavodosam. And I will save them from their work. Vugalti eschem mitzrayim natuyo. And I will redeem them with an outstretched arm. Ubishvatim gedolim. With great judgment against the Egyptians. Vulakachti eschem liliyom. And I will take you for myself as my people. And I will be your God. These are the four expressions of redemption. What are they? I will take you out. I will save you. I will redeem you. And I will take you. There's a fourth expression, fifth expression. And then ultimately, I will bring you to the promised land, which I promised, which I took an oath to Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, and it will be your heritage, inheritance forever. These are the four expressions of redemption. The reason why we drink, which are, it's only rabbinical, the four cups of wine at the Seder, each one of these cups correspond to one of the expressions of redemption. This is based on the Jerusalem Talmud. The first cup corresponds to Votsesi, I will take you out. The second cup corresponds to the Tzalti, I will save you. The third cup corresponds to the Goalti, I will redeem you. And the fifth cup, the fourth cup corresponds to Vlokachti Eschem Lilom, I will take you for myself as my people. And that's the reason rabbinically it was legislated by the rabbis. We drink four cups of wine to commemorate the four expressions of redemption. One can only fulfill his obligation of the four cups to commemorate the four expressions of redemption. It must be wine. And not only must be wine, I mentioned, if we drink, although we say Bopri Agofen on grape juice, to fulfill this mitzvah appropriately and properly, the grape juice has to have some kind of alcoholic content. Why? Because what do we celebrate? We're celebrating redemption. When you celebrate, you don't celebrate over grape juice. There has to be some alcoholic content which touches you, which gives you that sense of exhilaration, and therefore it has to have some degree of alcohol in it. So if a person, as I mentioned, is not able to drink wine, you could take two thirds grape juice, add a third wine, which naturally has alcohol, could be a small amount of alcohol, mix it, and you fulfill the mitzvah, of drinking the four cups of wine to commemorate the four expressions of redemption, which is an experience, an expression of celebration. That's what we do. Now, when God says to Moshe, tell the Jewish people, it just doesn't say, emor al b'nei Yisrael, lochein emor. The word lochem in Hebrew means therefore say to the Jewish people. Therefore, because I heard their outcries and their pain, how they're being enslaved, therefore tell the Jewish people. The word lochem. Numerically, the word lochem is 100. Nun is 50, numerically. Chof is 20. And Lamed is 30. So lochen is 100. So here I had mentioned in the past, the Balatur says, when did Avram father Yitzchok? He fathered Yitzchok, who was the second patriarch at the age of 100. Lochen, in the merit of Avram, the 100, the merit of Avram is alluding to Avram Avinu. When Avram became the father of the patriarch, Yitzchok, when he was 100 years old, in his merit, therefore you're meriting this level of redemption, the four expressions of redemption. That's firstly. 
Where else do we find the hundred? We read about Yitzchok that there was a famine in the land and he wanted to go to Egypt. And God says, because he had flocks, God says to him, do not leave the land as your father had left the land to go to Egypt. Remain in the land and you will have blessing in the land. Despite the fact that it was a famine year, the Torah tells us explicitly, he planted the crop and the pr- crop had a yield of a hundredfold of what a normal crop is in the, a normal year. And this was a famine year. It was May of Shorim was a hundred. So we find the hundred mentioned on a miraculous level in regard to Yitzchok, a hundred. And where do we find a hundred by Yaakov? Yaakov being the most special of the patriarchs. Because Yaakov had fathered all his children, all his sons by the age of 100. By the age of 100, he had the 12 tribes were in place. So the merit of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, which the number 100 is essential, Avram fathering Yitzchak at 100. Yitzchak experiencing this miracle not to leave the land. And Yaakov fathering all 12 sons by the age of 100, in their merit, you will merit the four expressions of, of redemption. To commemorate that, we drink four cups of wine, which each one corresponds to one of the expressions of Geula, of redemption. So we explained, and something just came to mind now, just adds to it. Why is the number 100 such a, essential and important number. So we find that when Yaakov had come back after being away for 22 years at the home of his father, Lovon, and he came back to Canaan, it, it says he purchased a piece of land, property in Shechem, and he paid Meok Sito, Ksita is a certain denomination of coin, which existed in the time of Yaakov when he returned to Canaan. He said he paid 100 Ksita for that piece of property, for that portion of land. And he went and he built an altar on that land to bring a sacrifice to God. So the question which bothered me was, if the Torah is sharing with us the price that he paid for the land, evidently it's important for us to know that what that number was, that it was 100. But of course, the obvious question is why, why now that I know he paid 100, exceed to the certain denomination of coin, what's, what do we learn from that? What's the 100? What is the representation of number 100? So we mentioned then the name of the Kliyokar, which is a commentator in the Torah. He writes on this issue, why does the Torah share with us the number of 100? He says, we find that in the temple, in the Beisah Migdosh, the covet sanctuary, the wall of the covet sanctuary was 100 amos, 100 cubits. That's what it was in height. Why was it 100 cubits? So he explains that initially before Adam ate of the tree of knowledge, which was good and evil, his dimension of person soared from earth to heaven. He radiated a radiance which had a semblance of God's radiance. That was his level of holiness. After he ingested the evil of that fruit, he was diminished. To what degree was it diminished? So the Midrash tells us God put his palm on him and he was reduced to 100 amos. His height was 100. Initially, he soared to heaven, from earth to heaven, and now he was reduced to 100 amos, 100 cubits in height. So what was the consequence of sin? It brought about what level of deficiency? He was reduced to 100. Due to the evil that became intermingled and intertwined in his being. What is the source of all sin? The source of all sin is the evil that existed in that fruit. Every human being 
who's a descendant of Adam, has is touched with this evil. And the reason why we're inclined to evil is because of that fruit of the tree of knowledge. So the source of all sin, the reason why we have these serious challenges is only because of the ingestion of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And the consequence was 100. So the number 100 represents the effect of that evil of the tree of knowledge. Now, what is the temple? What is the base of Mikdash? That's the location which we bring sacrifices for atonement. To make the corrections and atone and reinstate ourselves to a level where we should be to correct the sin. That's what kapor is. So the temple, the height of the wall of the covered sanctuary was 100. Why was it 100? Because 100 is the number representing the positive to counter and correct the deficiency that came about as a result of the tree of knowledge because Adam was reduced to 100. So 100 is the number in the positive to counter and correct and reinstate the negative consequence of the tree of knowledge. That's the Kliyokar. So therefore he says, when Yaakov purchased the property, it was with a specific intent, he paid 100 Sita. Why? Because that piece of property he bought was to build an altar. The purpose was to counter the tree of knowledge. That was its purpose. Therefore, he prepared the location for the altar and that it should be a location of atonement and therefore the number was 100. That's the Kliyokar. That's what Torah shares with us. The price that he paid for the property was 100. That his intent was, it should counter whatever the negative influence of the tree of knowledge was. Now, when did Avram father Yitzhak at the age of 100? What did Avram represent in this existence? He exact, it represented the antithesis of evil. The world was a pagan world. People didn't even know that there was a creator. There was an omnipotent being. They believed the deities, each one was independent. He went and espoused monotheism, even to the point that he was willing to die for it. He was thrown into a kiln. Avram did not have a son, wasn't able to father a son until he was 99 years old when he had the name changed from Avram to Avraham. And at the age of 100, this is when he actually had that son Yitzchak, which was the future patriarch, and it was the future of the Jewish people, because he was going to father Yaakov, who was going to be the most special of the patriarchs. So Avram fathering Yitzchak at the age of 100, what does that mean? What does that connote? He fathered the person. He achieved a level of representation of the positive, which is 100, to counter whatever that negative is, which also is connoted and quantified through 100. So it's the 100 on the positive side countering the 100 on the negative side. Yitzchak is known as the unblemished offering. Why did God tell Yitzhak not to leave the land? He said, stay in the land and you will plant and you will merit a miracle. Why did, Hashem, why did God say to Yitzhak, you, you should not go out of the land? Yitzhak himself is considered an unblemished offering. He was brought as an offering and God says, withdraw your hand from the land and you will bring a ram in his place. So, Yitzchak was originally consecrated to be brought as an offering. The law is that when you do the service in the sanctuary, if you take the animal outside of the sanctuary, in the middle of the service, the offering becomes invalidated because you took it, at, you took it out of its bounds. God says to Yitzchak, you're an unblemished offering. If you should leave the land of Israel, of Canaan, you're going out of bounds. If you go out of bounds, you become disqualified, you become invalidated. And it's crucial to maintain your level of sanctity and it should not be in any way violated. Therefore, stay in the land. 
He stays in the land. And wh what is the yield of the crop? A hundred. So what does a hundred connote? That only confirms his staying in the land that he was able to retain his level of representation, which is a hundred, because as a patriarch, he counters the evil of the eights of Das, the tree of knowledge, which is a hundred. That's what the Torah says specifically. He, the yield was a hundred. It's a confirmation of what his level of representation is. Of course, if he would have left, he would have been invalidated and disqualified as a patriarch because he'd no longer be that unblemished offering which retains its level of sanctity. Therefore, it's a hundred. Yaakov, being the chosen of the patriarchs, the most special of the patriarchs, he fathered all 12 sons, which ultimately were 13, which represent, as we mentioned, the name of the morale, the numerical value of Echod is 13. And the spiritual infrastructure of the 12, 13 children of Yaakov, actually not only numerically are 13, gradation-wise is Aleph Ches Dalet. Aleph, the most special, the most spiritual of Yaakov's children was Levi. He's Aleph. The children of the patriarchs are eight. Leah had six sons. Rochel had two. That's eight. That's Ches. And the, the, the children of the concubines, each one had two. That's Dalid. So therefore, not only are we numerically Echad, even gradation-wise, spiritually speaking, it's Aleph Ches Dalid. That happened when Yaakov was... So when did Yaakov establish the Echad? God's level of representation, that we had that commonality with God at the age of 100. So again, the 100 is that. Therefore, Lachain Amor, in the merit of the three patriarchs, which each of them have a, are the representation of 100, which counters all the evil, we speak about the four expressions of Gula, the four expressions of redemption, So over here, we mentioned the Balaturim. Seemingly, the four expressions of redemption have relevance to the exodus from Egypt. I will take you out, I will save you, I will redeem you, and I will take you as my people. However, the Balaturim says the four expressions of redemption, he says, Arba Lashonos Shel Geula, the four expressions of redemption, Keneged Arba Malchios, correspond to the four exiles, the four kingdoms, the four exiles that we were, we were under their influence. The last expression of redemption is, I will take them. Keneged Edom, that corresponds to the Edomite exile, which we, I mentioned earlier. Al it's like a person who wrenches, who yanks. You're going to have to be yanked out of the Edomites. Esau is not letting go. I will break that grip. And only if I break the grip will you merit the ultimate redemption. And that's the coming of Mashiach. So the four expressions of Egypt correspond to the four exiles. So we had asked in the past, Seemingly, what do the expressions of redemption of Egypt have to do with the four exiles, which we experience till the end of time, until the coming of Mashiach, which we're still experiencing at this moment. And the last one hasn't yet come, happened yet. In its fullest sense, I will take you, I will yank you out, and then I will destroy the Edomites. And then they will go into the oblivion. So I mentioned the Ramchal cites a Zohar. Initially, why did we go to Egypt? Because there was a covenant, which is known the covenant between the parts with Avram. And Hashem said it to Avram in a prophecy, you should know, your children will be strangers in the land which is not theirs and they will be enslaved, and they will be afflicted. And the nation that enslaved them will be judged. 
And then afterwards, they will go out with great wealth. And that's why we left each with great wealth. So Rabbi Shimba Yichoi, who's the author of the Zohar, asks, factually speaking, we were supposed to be in Egypt 400 years. We were there only 210 years. Not 400 years. So evidently, there's a balance to pay. So somehow, we have to reconcile this. If God said 400 years, at some level, we had to meet the number of 400. How did we meet that number? So there are many answers given. One answer is given that we weren't, if we would have stayed longer than the 210 year period, we would have been acculturated to the point that our, the little remnant of spirituality that was within us would have been stuffed out. It would have been extinguished. And we would have gone into the oblivion. God had to take us at exactly that moment to be able to reignite that spark of holiness that existed within us, our souls. But factually, there's 190 a balance that has to be paid on that debt. We're meant to be in Egypt 400 years. So the answer is, which is given, but it's not the full answer. It's like a compensation at best. God intensified the bondage to expedite the number so the 210 years should be the equivalent of 400 years. So although we were not Egypt 400 years, but due to the intensification of the bondage, the 210 are the equivalent of the 400. That's one of the answers which are given. Another answer which is given by the Midrash, that we count the time of 400 years from the birth of Yitzhak. From the moment Yitzhak was born, he was born on the 15th of Nisan. Until we left, it was exactly 400 years. So we lived 400 years in exile. But factually, we weren't in Egypt 410 years. So Reb Shimi Choy says that the 190 year balance, which was not paid because we had to leave at that moment, this is experiencing the exiles, the four exiles, till the end of time. That's payment of that debt. Meaning, we were impacted by the Egyptian exile. Egypt represents the evil on the most intense level. We had to be purged of that evil. The bondage purged us. We had to be there 400 years to be fully cleansed, expunged, purified but we, would not, we left after 210 years. So there was a remnant of that evil left within us. All the sufferings throughout exile is to filter out for us to reach a pure, a pure level of holiness. And we have to go through that smelter, that crucible to extract all that dross, all that evil, all that impurity from us. This is Rav Shemi Choy's answer in the Zohar. That's why we have the four exiles. So now, the four expressions of redemption, the Baran Torm says, corresponds to the four exiles, meaning the exiles that we're experiencing until the end of time is due to the evil which we absorbed within us due to the, due to, to the Egyptian experience. That's the reason why we're all tinged with this impurity, something which we contracted in Egypt. So the four expressions of exile, of redemption, which God said to Moshe to share with us, these expressions set certain dynamics in place that ultimately, by the end of time, we will be fully redeemed and fully secure to become God's nation. And when will that come to its climax? With the coming of Mashiach. That's after the Lokacht, I will wrench the Jewish people out of the Edomites to destroy them. That will be the conclusion of that exile. And that will happen with the building of the third temple at the coming of Mashiach at that time. That's when it's happening. So those forces had to be activated then 
that we should be beneficiaries with God's help quickly and soonly, soon with the coming of Mashiach for that reason. Just want to mention, we had mentioned this not long ago. Avram Avinu, Avram our patriarch, was not able to father Yitzhak, the future patriarch, unless, until he had the name change. Until he became Avraham, Abraham. Before he was Abram, he became Avraham. God let it, added the hate to his name. Until then, he couldn't father that child. I'm sorry, he named it. Sora was Sarai. She also became Sora. She had a hey added to her name. Avram had a hey added to his name. Sarai became Sora with a hey. What is the significance of the letter hey? You know that the numerical value of hey is five. But what's the significance of the hey? So we had said in the name of the Midrash, and the Gemara speaks about this. With the spirituality of which letters of the Hebrew alphabet did God create the physical and spiritual world? So the Talmud tells us with the spirituality which lies within the letter Yud, God created the world to come. And with the spirituality which lies within the letter He, God created the physical world. So God initially created that world that Adam was placed in, the Garden of Eden with the tree of knowledge. And when Adam ate of that tree of knowledge, what did he do to that world that was created with the hay? He putrefied it with the evil due to ingesting that fruit. And since the world itself was created on behalf of Adam, every action of Adam, its consequence is, is on a global level. So his ingesting of that fruit, the way it, that impurity expressed itself, every part of existence was touched by that evil. So the whole world was putrefied due to the evil of ingesting that fruit which contained this evil. It was the fruit of good knowledge, good and evil. Avram was part of that original existence. Avram, to be qualified, to be the location of the divine presence, God had to recreate Avram. His essence had to take on a new dimension that never pre-existed his existence. So just as the hay initially brought existence into existence, God again had to recreate Avram with the same power of that hay that Avram now becomes a new dimension of existence. He's the equivalent of all existence, except his existence has not been putrefied by the tree of knowledge. So this physical... Biologically, he's a descendant of, 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 of Adam. So he's inclined to evil, as Adam was. But what, he, what he's, be, has he, he's become, the new dimension, the new creation, that is the beginning of a new existence, that hasn't been putrefied. Therefore, Avram is qualified to counter whatever that evil is. Savram, so when was he qualified to father that child? To count in the hundred of the tree of knowledge, we said that Adam was diminished to a hundred at the age of a hundred. That's when he had the name change from Avram to Avraham, and that's when he became a new creation. The spiritual metamorphosis took place within him. He was a new dimension of being to be able to be represent God to counter the evil and ultimately destroy it. Yitzchak being the, the unblemished offering that on every day of judgment, it silences the prosecution of Satan. When did he become, in, what did he plant? God said, you can't leave the land because the, the confines of the land is the equivalent of the walls of the sanctuary. If you bring that sacrifice out of the sanctuary, you invalidate it. You leaving the confines of Canaan, you become invalidated. So to maintain your spiritual effectiveness and power and representation, you cannot leave the land. 
How was it proven that he was able to retain it? Because in a famine year, when he planted his crop, he had a hundred yield of a normal year, which is something unheard of. Again, it's a hundred. That was a confirmation that he is that rep level of representation to counter the evil, which is represented by a by hundred. Yaakov fathered his 12 sons, which are the chosen people at the age of, by the age of 100, he had all 12 sons in place, which is the Echod, which counters, that's God's representation in existence, which counters whatever evil, which is represented by Edom. We say, Akoko Yaakov, I die me the Esav. The voice is the voice of Jacob. And the hands are the hands of the Esau. As long as the voice is the voice of age of Jacob, Torah, and Tefillah, which is voice, verbal expression, Esau is totally incapacitated. But if God forbid, if the voice of Yaakov falls silent, then we feel the brunt of the hands of Esau. So how is Yaakov effective and depicted and meaningful if we hear his voice? That's a kol kol Yaakov. And, the, and how does it manifest itself through the tribes, through his children? He was 100 years old. That 100 is a representation taking on that dimension of value that now he counters the 100, which is a consequence of the tree of knowledge. So it was the merit of the three patriarchs that we merited the redemption, the four expressions of redemption, which ultimately continues to evolve until the end of time when Edom will be destroyed. That's v'lokachti eschem li'lo'om. I will take you as my people. And with this, you're able to understand the first bracha in the Amido. We say, Elokei Avram, Elokei Yitzchok, Elokei Yaakov. The God of Avram, Yitzchok, and Yaakov. But we conclude Mogen Avram, the shield of Avram. And the Midrash says, maybe if God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he was, they were his location, this existence, the the Holy of Holies, the blessing should end. Mogen, Avram, Yitzchok, Yaakov. He's the shield of all three of them. So the answer is no. God, the Torah says, we will conclude the first blessing of the Amida only with you. Question is why? If Yaakov was the most special of the patriarchs, that he was qualified to father the 12 tribes, his name should be mentioned in the conclusion of the blessing. The answer is simple. Why was the world recreated? Why did Avram take on a dimension of the equivalent of a new creation? What was needed to create the whole existence the terrestrial celestial, which was the hay, you needed to recreate Avram to be a new being, to begin a new creation. And whose merit did that come about? That was the merit of Avram. It's true, within that context, Yaakov surpassed Avram. But Yaakov developed and evolved within which context? In that new existence. But in whose merit did that, was that new existence created? only in the merit of, merit of Avram. Therefore, when we conclude the bracha, it's Mogen Avram, it's the shield of Avram, because if not for Avram, through his merit, allowing a new world, a new existence to be created, there would have never been a Yitzchak, there would have never been a Yaakov, because they would have been tainted with the evil of the first existence, if everything is attributed to Avram, and therefore it concludes Mogen Avram, and not Mogen Avram Yitzchak Yaakov for that reason. That's the understanding. We find that the three species of sacrifices that were brought to the temple, only, there were only three domestic species which qualify. Shor, the ox, the sheep, and the goat. Why these three species? So Midrash tells us, we know the famous story of Avram's hospitality to the angels who came in human form. What did he serve them? He served them the tongues of three calves. The calf is the ox.
Avram was about to slaughter his only child, who was, he was promised to, to be the future of existence. God says, the angel calls out, withdraw your hand from the lad. And all of a sudden, suddenly he sees a ram caught in the thicket. The ram is the sheep. So in the merit of Yitzchak, we have the species of the sheep qualified to bring about atonement. What, where do we find the goat? When Yaakov had gone to take the blessings, which was the birth thread, which was rightfully his, his mother tells him, go to the flock, take two, two goats, and I will make delicacies for, you, delicacies for your father, and through that you will receive the blessing. So the blessings of Yitzchok, of Akoko Yaakov, came as a result of those two goats. As a result of that, each one of these species, whether it's the ox, the sheep, or the goat, represents every one of the patriarchs. So why do we merit the mercy of God to be atoned for our transgressions, our inadvertent transgressions? It's the merit of Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. Again, who represent the counterforce, which is atonement to the hundred, which is on the negative side for that reason. Over here, the Sephardo says, he's one of the commentators, what's Goalti? I redeemed, seemingly, when we left Egypt, we were redeemed. He says, until the Egyptians drowned in the sea, we were not fully redeemed. Why weren't we redeemed? Because although we did not leave Egypt as fugitives, we left, it was at midday, and we were driven out of the land, but ultimately, we knew we'd be pursued by the Egyptians because we took all their wealth. A slave knowing that his master is still alive and he could always recapture him. Psychologically, he's not a free man. The only time we became truly redeemed, emotionally, mentally, was only when we saw the remains of the Egyptians on the side of the sea. What well, was confirmed, they were no longer alive. Our masters were no longer alive. So Ga'alti, when did we experience the Gula with the closing the sea on the Egyptians and the remains being thrown onto the seashore, seeing visually that our oppressors, our masters were no longer alive. That was when we achieved the full brunt of the Gula of the redemption. As we say, you know, everything's in the mind, in the emotion. And a person can be shackled emotionally. You know, there used to be an expression, we didn't use this expression today. He's a mental cripple. We used to use an expression, he's a mental case. You don't hear that. Me mentally, a person, you can be physically intact, functional, but if you mentally, emotionally impacted negatively, you, you, that in, that in, it infringes on your function, on your sense of value, and to be able to be productive and advance in life. Always shackled, knowing that there's something looking over your shoulder and haunting you. Once you see that removed from existence, now all of a sudden vistas, the sun starts shining at a level that you never believed it could shine. So only when the Egyptians were drowned and they saw with their visually that their own with their own eyes that their masters no longer existed. That's Gualti. That's that's Gula. That's true redemption. Now we know factually we're free to do as we please and as we choose, fully to make choices as we as we choose to make choices, whatever the initiatives may be. I think we're going to stop today. We're here.
and I'm open 